morning. Welcome this morning. So glad you're all here with us. Good to see you and welcome to those who are online visiting or staying at home or doing what everybody's doing. So glad to have people out here today. It's good to see everybody. We're going to continue our study in Matthew. So if you have your Bibles, if you'll open to Matthew chapter 18, we're going to pick up uh, in verse 6. Our title this morning is Unforgiveness is Unacceptable. Unforgiveness is Unacceptable. Father, we ask that you would open our ears this morning, that our hearts would be in tune to your word, that we hear what you have to say to us, that your spirit draw us close to you as we study your word, and let us take your word, Lord, and apply it in our lives moment by moment and day by day. We know it's your word that sustains us, feeds us, and strengthens us. And we thank you for your word. We thank you for the time we have together, Lord, to worship, corporately worship. But, Lord, worship begins as the attitude of the heart. And we just want to be together with the heart to hear you this morning. And we thank you and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. So the last time we were together... And we were studying, we saw how Jesus loves the children. How he says, you know, let the children come unto me, and, and those who come to me as a child uh, can receive him. And I believe he looks at the new believers as little children. For as we come to him with a childlike faith, he receives us, because it's truly a childlike faith that we all need. Too many times, as, as I mentioned before, you know, as a child, we... Uh, we, we accept things, we trust, we have that unconditional trust as a child, but the older we get and the more of this world that we see, the less trust that we have. And we want to be in this place in our faith where, Lord, we believe you for who you are. We believe you for your word. We believe you because you're a God who teaches us and leads us and will never lead us down the wrong path. So we want to come to you with that childlike faith. We want to be in that relationship with you. And we also looked at the proper order last week in dealing with someone who sins against us. But before we take the steps that are outlined in verses 15 through 17, we first must go to the Lord and make sure that our hearts are right. Because any time when we've been wounded, if we go back as wounded or, or letting that woundedness drive what we do, then we're in the flesh. And we respond in the flesh. And when we respond in the flesh... It escalates. It never, ever settles when we operate in the flesh. And so we have to come in the Spirit. So before we can do that, we go to the Lord before we approach our brother or sister. And we just, we, we just throw fuel on the fire otherwise. Now this week we're going to pick up, and I said verse 6, but I miss, misspoke. We're going to pick up in verse 18 this week. And we'll continue to see how these next few verses in context, continue with the same thing. But before we get to that, let's pick up at verse 15, and we're going to kind of keep it in context and read forward. So verse 15 in Matthew uh, chapter 18, Moreover, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he hears you, you have gained your brother. But if he will not hear, take with you one or two more, that by the mouth of two or three witnesses... Every word may be established. And if he refuses to hear them, tell it to the church. But if he refuses to hear even the, even the church, let him be to you like a heathen and a tax collector. And we looked at that was kind of a harsh statement, wasn't it? Because we know what heathens and tax collect collectors look like, particularly, you know, in their time frame. A tax collector was usually a Jewish man that was collecting taxes from fellow Jews under the Roman authority. They were not looked upon very nicely. Now continuing in verses 18 through 20, Assuredly I say to you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again, I say to you that if two of you agree on earth concerning anything that they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, I am there in the midst of them. 
Now, the reason, I, the reason I wanted to go back to verse 15 is I do want to keep this passage in context with everything that's been flowing so far. And I've heard, and I still hear today, verse 18 quoted alone and separate by itself. And people are binding this and they're binding that in the spirit. And I do believe that we have authority in the spirit realm to cast out demons. Jesus gave that authority to the apostles. I don't believe that that actually stopped at that time. I believe we still have that same authority, but we have to be first in relationship with God before we actually get involved in any of these other type of spiritual things. And I believe that the Bible is clear regarding the devil having to flee from us when we submit to him first. James 4, 7 says, Therefore submit to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. And again, I've heard this verse quoted, but usually only partially quoted. Many conveniently leave out the submitting to God. They just want to resist the devil. <laughs> we, all, we all want to resist the devil, but in our fleshly nature, we can't do it on our own. We have to have the power of God. We have to have the Holy Spirit. We have to have his strength, not our own to cast out or to resist the devil. And as believers, we need to make sure that we're submitted to God before we enter any type of spiritual warfare. Otherwise, otherwise it will not end well. When the flesh is involved, it wrestles against the spirit, the spirit against the flesh, but we have to submit to God and be in his strength before we enter any type of spiritual warfare. Now in our text this morning, the binding on earth and in heaven isn't really speaking of spiritual warfare here. That's not really the context of what this is about. It's speaking of church discipline. We had just read 15 through 17, and it tells us in the church order how we're to approach our brother or sister, how we're to deal with those situations, take two or more, and then take it to the church if they don't receive the, the word that we have. And it gives us the instructions on how to handle these type of situations regarding those who sin against us. But once that's done, depending on whether or not the individual re repents, the decision on how to deal with them is either bound or loosed. And let me explain that. If they do not repent, then according to these verses in context, the decision or ruling or judgment by the church is a binding one. It's a binding situation. You're basically saying, listen, we've come to you we presented this first individually, then we brought two or more witnesses, and now we bring the church, and you're still refusing to see what Scripture says about the sin that you've committed. Therefore, we now have the authority to bind you in this situation so that you do not have the activity to do what you want to do when you want to do it within the body of Christ. This binding ruling here and now in the body of Christ is on earth, and it's also bound in heaven. Again, this is, has specifically to do with church discipline and restoration, if needed be. If there is repentance and restoration, this ruling or judgment is loosed from the individual here in the body of Christ on earth and also in heaven. Now, another point here, nothing is to be bound or loosed on our own. If you say, stay within the context of these verses... If you come up with an individual and, again, they've sinned against you and, and they've wounded you to then come into your own heart, well, I bind you and, or I bind the enemy over you, I bind this, I bind that. That's not what we're talking about here. In context, we need to have two or three witnesses first, then the body of Christ together, and all of this is taking place in order, corporately, in accordance to the leadership of the church, by the power of the Holy Spirit, we take it to that level and say, listen, this situation has now come to where we have to put a closure on it. So we bind this situation. Or if they repent, we loose in this situation. But again, individually, this is not something that we're supposed to take on ourselves. Now, I know that this teaching may go against some that we've heard regarding the binding and loosening. In some circles, there's a lot of binding and loosening of demons every week, strongholds of sin every week from individuals. And for some reason, they're rebound the next week. That's not always the case, but the point I'm making here is that it becomes, if you're not careful, this whole thing of binding and loosening really starts focusing on, on the power that we have, and we're going to bind this, and we're going to bind that, and we're going to loose this, and we're going to loose that. But we have to keep everything in context 
for what we're talking about this morning. Scripturally, we're given the authority to cast out demons. But even in that, we need to make sure that we're listening to the Holy Spirit. That we're in close relationship with the Lord regarding the binding of anything. And even in strongholds. You know, we talk about the binding of strongholds. In 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 5, it says, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments in every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. And again, if you look at that passage, this is not about binding or loosening in the spiritual realm, but it's basically spiritually taking control over our own flesh. Because it's our flesh that we struggle with more than demons. And I know, again, that's, that's something sometimes we don't always hear, but the demonic realm has no control over us as believers in Jesus Christ. We don't have to continue to bind them over this and that. More, moreover than that, we need to be coming to the Lord moment by moment, day by day, and saying, Lord, I'm struggling in my flesh. And yes, the enemy is throwing temptation. And yes, I'm being tempted. I'm being drawn to go back. But what's being drawn? My flesh is being drawn back. And so it's not a matter of binding them. It's a matter of submitting to you and dying to myself. That's what we're called to do. Now you might say, well, what about Matthew 16, 19? Because he speaks there about the binding and loosening. And in verse 19 and, and chapter 16, we read, And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Now, when we studied this earlier, and we do go through first, first by verse, chapter by chapter, we looked at the spiritual keys, which Jesus said, I give to you the keys of heaven. What were those keys that we talked about? Prayer, and the word of God, and the leading of the Holy Spirit. Those are three of the main keys that we're talking about in a relationship with God. But another aspect of these keys is the structure or the foundation of, of the church it was given to the apostles it was given to them by the power of the holy spirit to go to all the world making disciples and they did just that particularly paul who was a, the apostle to the gentiles and he planted churches all over in different locations in different places and the keys there were given to them but in context of what we're talking about here there is order and that order included boundaries and authority to be placed and to remove those boundaries just as we're speaking of today. In other words, if something needed to be bound because of the order or the uh, attitude of things that were going along, they had the authority to do that. They bound or they loose, just like we're talking about today. And if we're using these keys given to us and we follow scriptural guidelines on order and church discipline, then we have the authority to bind and loosen in context with what we've learned this morning. Again, regarding sin in the body and sin in the church. And if you remember the story of, of Paul when in the Corinthian church, there was a sin of an individual going on in that church, and that sin was, was not even heard of, is what Paul said. This sin has not even been heard of, but basically a man was actually taking his father's wife. And the church was doing nothing about it. And Paul said, this should not be so. And he went and he handled that situation and said, this man should be turned over to Satan to be buffeted. But later, later we read, this man repented and he was restored. And the power of restoration, the power of love, the power of forgiveness, all of these things come together. And I know that, that it's important that we see them in context for what they are. But church discipline and church order is very important because if you don't have that in place, then pretty much chaos can ensue. And people can be doing this, they can be doing that, all in the name of the Lord, but it may not be the Lord that's directing. And we have to make sure that we're focused on Him 
We need to make sure that our eyes are on him. And we talked about this last week as well. Individually is where the responsibility is. Because if we come to the Lord individually, submitted to him, resisting the devil, dying to our flesh, seeking the, the will of the Lord for our life, if we're all willing to do that individually, then when we come together corporately, we're all in unity one with another. And that's what we're called to do in Philippians chapter 2, being united one with another. But in order to be united with each other, we have to be united to him first. And there seems to be a disconnect on that because a lot of times in, in our culture, particularly in, in the church culture, we hear, oh, well, we're, we're just not united. That's not, we don't have, we don't have revival because we're not united one with another. Well, then let's take a step back. If we're not, if we're not united with other churches or other groups, if we're not united with them, then are we doing our part? To seek the Lord individually so that, number one, we're in unity with Him. Then we're in unity with one another. Then we're following the lead of the Holy Spirit. As we follow the lead of the Holy Spirit, if other groups are doing the same thing, we are united. Now, that doesn't mean that we're all doing the same thing at the same time. Their legs, their feet, their hands, their eyes, the mouth. All of these different parts of the body are functioning at the same time, but they're not functioning doing the same thing. So unity doesn't necessarily mean that every church in your community come together and do this big event. Is that wrong to do that? No, I'm not saying it's wrong to do that, but it needs to be the leading of the Holy Spirit, not community-driven, God-driven. Because community, when community drives anything, when culture drives anything, the ways of the world mix in and mess up what God wants to do. God doesn't do things according to the world. His wisdom, it makes foolishness of the world's wisdom. And so it's very important that as we look into this and we're talking about church order, binding and loosening, when we're talking about all of these things, we need to be focused first and foremost that we have to have order, and order can only come through the power of the Holy Spirit, working individually first, then coming in corporately, and then we're all doing what God wants us to do. Now, verse 20 is also to be looked at in context. For where two or three are gathered together, in my, I'm there in the midst of them. I've also often jokingly said, well, the reason that, that Jesus has to be in the midst of two or three is because there's usually a fight between the two, and he has to come settle it. But in reality, he is there to, con to make sure that we're all focused together on the same thing. He is our focus. If Jesus is not in the midst of us, then why do we gather? If Jesus is not in the midst doing what he's doing, why do we come together as a body of, of believers? We believe in him. We believe in his leading, and he needs to be there. And it's when two or more witnesses, in context of what we're talking about, are gathered here, he's right there in the middle guiding on how to deal with situations in the church. That's our focus. Now, you may say, well, shouldn't every situation be handled the same? Shouldn't we not have the same ruling, the same judgment, the same binding, the same loosening? All of that is dependent upon the leading of the Holy Spirit and the willingness of individual or individuals to submit to the leading of the Holy Spirit. Everything needs to be looked at in that context because if we're not careful, you can put everything in a box. Oh, well, you've done this, then this is where you go. If you've done this, then this is what we're going to do. If you, no, we need to say, Lord, examine our hearts, examine their heart, bring us together. You're right here in the middle. Put us on the right path that you're guiding us on how to deal with this situation. Now, again, I know that this may be a slightly different view regarding the binding and loosening than what we've been taught. But in context, that's what this is all about. And one of the biggest issues that the church has today is they don't take things so much in context anymore. And cults, I mean, cults in some cases are built because of a verse that's been pulled out and they build a whole belief system around that one verse instead of putting it in context, precept upon precept, line upon line, listening, learning, 
looking at the whole picture. And in truth, as individuals, we don't have the whole picture. Only God does. And what a blessing it is when we come to that understanding to say, God, I don't have all the answers. He just kind of sits back and says, yeah, I know that. Glad you finally came to know that. But we know the one who does. And he will give us the answers we need. He will give us the area of discipline that we need. He will give us everything that we need when we need it. And we don't need to be defending God. God's word is truth. It defends itself. The entire Bible is the best commentary. Old Testament and New Testament. You can glean so much if we read and study and meditate and understand that it's the entire counsel of God's word that we're dependent upon. Even the, even the Apostle Paul in the book of Acts said, he said, I, I, there's no blood on my hands. I have not failed to give you the entire counsel of God's word. And that's what we're supposed to do. We need to be focused on the entire council, not taking bits and pieces. And again, if you're not careful, you can find yourself taking all the wonderful blessing passages and, and, and missing the repenting and the what sin is passages. But you have to have all of it to be balanced. And we want to be balanced in the Lord. In verses 21 through 35. Then Peter to him and said, Lord... How often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Up to seven times. You know, the number seven represents perfection. So I'm sure Peter was thinking, yeah, seven's a good number. Let me pull that number out. And Jesus said, said to him, I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to 70 times seven. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. And when he had begun to settle accounts, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. But as he was not able to pay, his master commanded that he be sold with his wife and children and all that he had and that the payment be made. The servant therefore fell down before him saying, Master, have patience with me and I will pay you all. Then the master of that servant was moved with compassion, released him and forgave the debt. But that servant went out and found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. And he laid his hands on him and took him by the throat, saying, Pay me what you owe. So his fellow servant fell down at his feet and begged him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay you all. And he would not, but went and threw him into prison till he should pay the debt. So when his fellow servants saw what had been done, they were grieved and came and told their master all that had been done. Then his master, after he had called him, said to him, You wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you begged me. Should you not also have had compassion on your fellow servant, just as I had pity on you? And his master was angry and delivered him to the torturers until he should pay all that was due to him. In verse 35, So my heavenly Father also will do to you if each of you from his heart does not forgive his brother his trespasses. Now you might ask, well, what do these verses have to do with, with everything we just talked about binding and loosening? What, is, what has this got to do with, with all that we've been reading this morning? Did Jesus go off on a rabbit trail? <laughs> well, I tend to do that, do that, but he doesn't. <laughs> He's always got a purpose in his word. And these verses are the key to all we've studied this morning and last week. Forgiveness ties it all together. Forgiveness ties it all together. If we don't forgive, then our hearts are not right to deal with any brother or sister who sinned against us. And we talked about that last week. Well, well, how can I, how can I, if someone sinned against me, how can I go and deal with that situation when they're not being frustrated, with not being angry, with not being dealing with it in the ways that, it, that, that I feel in my emotions. Well, forgiveness helps us to release all of the fleshly no, uh, aspect of our emotions. When we forgive, we are no longer holding them in contempt. We're no longer holding them in judgment of our heart. We're no longer telling them, okay, I'm not going to forgive you. I'm not going to forget this. I'm not going to let this go. What we're saying is, 
Now we can come to our brother or sister if we've truly forgiven in our hearts and say, I want to discuss this spiritually in the Lord and according to His Word. And we're not coming with anger and frustration and bitterness in our hearts. Because when that happens, we're not in a place to be able to deal with it. And this is the self-examination that we talk about frequently here. And when I talk about self-examination, I'm not talking about me, 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 all about me, all about me all the time. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is, is that when we have felt or know that someone has sinned against us, when we know that something is going on in our own lives, we need to go before the Lord. We need to put ourselves on our faces before Him and say, God, this is what is happening. This is what I'm feeling. This is how I want to deal with it. Now let me give it to you. Be anxious for nothing, but in all things with prayer and supplication. And then the peace of God that surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and minds. In other words, even when we've been sinned against, even when we're facing these horrible situations that people do to other people, and it happens even in the church, sadly. But when these things happen, we can receive that peace that surpasses all understanding because we are no longer fighting the battle that is not ours to fight. We're letting it go. Now, does that mean that that there's no accountability? Oh, no. No, there's accountability. But we're not the one holding the accountability card. We've now done what we're told to do, biblically. We've released it to the Lord. We go in the Spirit. If it's received, wonderful. If it's not, then we take two or three witnesses. If it's not received, we go to the church. The point I'm making here is everything happens in according to the Spirit when we are submitted to the Spirit and allowing it to happen the way it's supposed to. Forgiveness doesn't mean, though, that we just let everything go. This clearly shows us this morning that you can forgive, but still people are held accountable. Whether or not they accept their responsibility to be accountable or take responsibility for things that they've done, that's not the issue here. And that's another aspect that we as believers have to understand that just because we've submitted and done what we're supposed to do doesn't always mean that the other person will do what they're supposed to do. Now that within itself can stir a whole thing up again, can it? How many times have we really felt like we've gone to someone in love, in gentleness, because of something that they said or did? How many times have we gone to them and when they didn't respond, we just get all riled up again? Well, if we've truly released it, then we've released them from personal judgment on our part. We're not the judge. We don't judge anyone. The Bible says, do not judge lest you shall be judged. And whatever measure you throw out there, it's going to come right back on you. It's not our place to judge. Now, let me say this. The world will tell you that if you tell something that the Bible says regarding sin and you say it, you're judging them if they're practicing this sin. Or how dare you judge me? I've even heard Christians say that. Don't judge me. I'm, I'm saying what the Bible says. That's not judgment. That's truth. If you don't receive truth, that's your issue between you and God. He will be the one to bring judgment. Nobody's judging now. We're given the opportunity to see truth for what it is. If you choose to repent, hallelujah. If you choose not to, I'm sorry, but God is the one and His Word is the one that stands against you, not me. And so we have to be able to come to that point to speak truth but speak it in love and in gentleness not out of the flesh because the bible has been used the bible it says the word of god is a sword well sometimes we want to go chopping things down and we go around with the bible swinging it and beating people up that's not what we're supposed to do the word of god itself brings offense that's what jesus said he said i bring offense the rock of offense we don't need to go out there and create an offense. All we have to do is love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength and love one another as ourself. If those two laws that Jesus said all the law and the prophets are hung upon, if they're effective in our life and they have to be in order, 
loving him first, then loving one another, if those are in place, doing what he's called us to do, then he is responsible to take care of everything else, not us. And it's how much freedom is in that? It's a relief to know that we don't have to be judge and jury. It's a relief to know that all we have to do is our part, which is submitting to God, trusting Him. He takes care of everything else. Now, you might say, well, He hadn't taken care of it in the timeline that I like it to be taken care of. Well, again, that's flesh. See, God is not bound up by our timetable. He's not bound by time at all. Past, present, future, God is, period. Now, that's hard for us to understand. But it's the truth. He knows all. He's not bound by time or history. And so what we have to do is we have to come to our, to within ourselves and say, I trust you to deal with this in according to your timetable. And I take myself off, you know, out of the situation so I'm not trying to rule anything or dictate anything or fix anything. How many fixers do we have in here? Don't raise your hand. I'm sorry. A lot of fixers. A lot of us have that, that heart to want to fix a problem. But we can't. If we could fix their problems, we could have fixed our own. And none of us have been able to do that so far. It does show us that we can, we can still forgive and release them. The accountability is going to be between them and God. And we're held accountable for what we do including if we choose not to forgive. That's an area that we're held accountable for. In the church today, I can, I can ask you to raise your hand if you want. Everybody wants forgiveness from God. I mean, everybody will raise their hand. Yes, I want forgiveness from God. Yes, I want to have that forgiveness, at least for the sins that I acknowledge. Another area there. But few are willing to forgive others as they've been forgiven. It's very hard to forgive. It's very hard to let things go. Now, this 70 times 7 number isn't a number that Christians can multiply out and say, okay, you're at 489. One more and it's over. That's not what God is saying here. That's not what Jesus meant. This was to say that there's no limit to our forgiveness one to another. There should be no limit. Now, what about trust? There is an aspect that you can forgive, not hold judgment over a brother or sister or anyone in your life, but trust has to be rebuilt. Because there are situations where there's physical altercations and things like that. You do not need to be staying in that situation. You can forgive but you have to be also wise and you have to make sure that you are not putting this per or putting yourself in a situation where, well, I've forgiven, so you get hit again. I've forgiven, I, this happens again. I forgive. No, trust has to be rebuilt. Now, God views our sin this way. He forgives. He loves us. And I can promise you this morning that there's no one in this room no one listening online, nowhere, everywhere, anywhere that hasn't sinned more than 590 times against the Lord. It's the flesh. It's that nature that we're dying to every day. But when we repent, His mercy and grace continually flows to His children, doesn't it? The Holy Spirit's referred to often as a river. And he flows, and he flows, and he flows. And in verse 35, we're told that if we don't forgive as God forgives, how he will deal with that situation. In Matthew 6, 12, it says, And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. That's conditional, isn't it? You forgive our debts as we forgive others' debts. In Matthew 6, 14, through 15, for if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive 
your trespasses. See, forgiveness is a commandment from God. And every person will be held accountable to God regarding his or her heart toward others. Now, in context with what we've read this morning, to, to forgive means that we have the freedom to approach someone without judgment toward them. And if they receive your word and repent, then no binding or loosening is applied here. If they do not receive your word, you now have freedom to bring two or more witnesses. Now, let me say that those two witnesses or more that you bring also need to be subject to the Lord before they come to this individual because they need to come without judgment. And if then this goes to the church and they reject that counsel, then the church discipline is applied and it's bound and applied to this individual. But even in that, the binding is in accordance to God's word, not in unforgiveness on our part. And loosening is applied again corporately if one repents and is restored. Without forgiveness, none of this can take place. The church discipline, the church order, everything regarding the walk with Christ, everything about the church moving together in unity, none of that can, takes pl can take place if we have unforgiveness in our hearts. Loosening, again, is applied corporately if one repents and restored. Not only will the one who sinned against you be out of fellowship with the Lord if we come in the flesh, but we too will be out of fellowship with the Lord. I encourage you this morning, again, and we end a lot of our messages with this thought, we need to go before the Lord. We need to have Him examine our hearts. And I promise you this, if you're really seeking His will for your life and you come to Him and say, God, I need you to see, show me what you see. I need you to examine my heart because I kind of sometimes tend to lie to myself. The heart of man is deceitful above all things. And in the flesh, we can convince ourselves it's always somebody else's fault. It's always some other issue. It's always them, that, the other, wherever. It's never us. But the Holy Spirit wants to come and examine that with you. This is not to put you on trial here. What this is for is for you to be able to see what God wants you to see in your own heart regarding where he wants to take you, regarding the areas that we need to repent from, the areas of unforgiveness. And I'm going to tell you, today in the world that we live in, unforgiveness has brought so much pain and suffering. And even in the church, unforgiveness has caused church splits. It's called caused damage in relationships. People can't heal. They can't move forward because unforgiveness is prominent. We need to go before the Lord. We need to examine our hearts. Ask Him to show us where any unforgiveness or hidden, uh, where any unforgiveness is hidden or buried in our hearts. And, and sometimes, and this again is human nature, we, we tend to just bury it and then forget it. Okay, well, you may actually forget certain situations we do we forget things sometimes even some of the hardest things we want to forget but once it's been buried what happens a seed of a seed is planted in your heart a seed of unforgiveness leads to a seed of bitterness and a seed of bitterness grows and sometimes people act out on things that they don't even remember where they've unforgiven. But it's there. And it's a pattern. And it shows up. And the Lord would say, I want to go and I want to go on, a, on a, uh, an archaeological dig here. Let's go back. Let's dig into your heart and let's forgive. And let's kill that, heart, that aspect of bitterness. Because if we don't acknowledge it and we don't repent and forgive it, it's going to show up somewhere in our lives. And usually it will show up corporately in groups. And this is essential in our walk, individually and corporately. If we want to be an obedient 
an effective church. Each one has to do these things. Hebrews 12, 15 says, Looking carefully, lest anyone fall short of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up cause trouble. And by this, many become defiled. See, unforgiveness in your heart affects a whole lot of people. It flows out of you. And if bitterness gets in, it flows out. And what does it say? Many become defiled. But primarily, the one who is unforgiving, they are defiled the most because they have held that in. When you hold unforgiveness in your heart, the Holy Spirit can't penetrate that. You don't want to hear what God has to say about it. But God, you know what they did. Of course he does. Does he, does he look upon them and say, well, you know, he doesn't rationalize as to why they did it. He doesn't do any of that. He wants to deal with that individual according to their sin, but he wants to deal uh, with us according to ours. And unforgiveness is a sin. And you may say, well, that's, that's so basic. Everybody knows about unforgiveness. True, everybody knows about it. But applying it is a whole different level because we can't do it on our own. This always comes back to the aspect of who we are in Christ. He's the head. The Spirit is within us. We are the temple of the Holy, the Holy Spirit. His Word comes to life. We have all of this right here at our disposal to grab a hold of, to use, to process. But so many times we get so far and we say, uh-uh, I'm not forgiving them. I'm not doing that. You're going to have to fix them, God. And relationships. And many times, many of you in the same situation, you've sat down with, with couples in relationships and, and it's all about the other person. It's their fault. It's always their fault. And typically when I come into those situations, I just stop and I say, look, okay, this is, this is not where we're going today. If you're not willing to examine your heart and they're not willing to examine their heart, not each other, be judge and jury of each other. If you're not willing to do that, then the marriage is in trouble because there's unforgiveness and there's defilement, and you're going to constantly be digging that up and throwing it at them, digging it up and throwing it at them, digging it up and throwing it at them. And God wants us to let it go. He wants us to be moving together forward, not fighting with one another, stalled out. All of this is what we're talking about this morning. It is all in context, and unforgiveness is unacceptable in the eyes of the Lord. And I praise God for his forgiveness. I praise God that I can come to him and say, God, forgive me for what I did, what I said, how I acted, all of these things. Because we're all human and these things will come up. But the wonderful thing is, is that if we're willing to do that, then he also wants us to take the step further. He said, okay, with the forgiveness I've given you, take that and forgive others. Let's grow together this way God will do the work in the heart of other people and we're not we're not responsible for people's responses to us we're not responsible for if they accept it or reject it we're not responsible for any of that what we're responsible for is how we deal with it and that can only come through the word through prayer and through the power of the Holy Spirit he will reveal it to us and and I want to encourage you to take the time to do these things. Take the time and your time with the Lord and, and be alone with Him and ask Him, Lord, show me. Show me. And He will do that. It may not be pretty. <laughs> he may show you something that you never thought existed in your own heart. But when that's revealed and it's dealt with, oh, what peace. What joy. What love. What is that? The fruits of the Spirit? Think about that for a minute. 
fruit grows on healthy trees. And if you're a tree and you are planted by the Lord, you should be producing fruit. But if bitterness and unforgiveness is there, that fruit is not being produced in accordance to what He wants to produce in you. And the Holy Spirit gives us the fruit of the Spirit, and all of these things are ours, but are we keeping Him from being able to give it because of our own attitude of our hearts? Something to examine, something to look at. And these words are not to be condemning. There is no condemnation in Christ Jesus. But while there's no condemnation, there is accountability. And it's something we all need to take a look at. Father, we come.